this is a question from Koji uh, Nii in the US, uh, who is in the media theater. And then uh, the question is, Deng brought reform to China, but not thorough. Do you think a Chinese leader in the near future is able to bring further reform to China, especially political reform? It will take a strong leader to be able to do this. Um, many people thought Deng was opposed to political reform. But in fact, that was not the case. Uh, and he was willing to allow more democracy. What he said was that uh, if there is political support, then one can undertake fundamental political reforms. If without uh, that kind of uh, political stability and political support, uh, you cannot really undertake reforms that really work. So in 1978, he allowed people to continue to write on democracy wall for several months until he became so upset that he felt that they were too attacking the government. It would affect the government's ability to rule. Uh, he made again a strong speech in August 1980, advocating political reform. And again in 1986, he allowed Zhao Ziyang to carry on a major discussion of political reform and some of those things they even tried to do uh, in 1987 at the 13th Party Congress. So I think that it is possible to have some political reform. The, the danger, I think, that is seen by a lot of the Chinese leaders, that what they would, re what we would think of as reforms, the people might see with softness, uh, and that. Uh, I think they were, Deng was very worried, for example, that Hui Albang was too soft. Uh, Deng and his followers thought they were creating more democracy, but from Deng's point of view, authority might fall apart. So I think the current leaders and the future leaders are also worried that because China is so large, has had so much trouble uh, remaining unified, they're really worried that uh, political steps to reform might be seen as too much softness. However, I think that the situation is sufficiently serious now in terms of public attitude toward corruption uh, and also uh, for uh, attitudes toward political reform, they might have some change. I was personally very interested in this village of Wukhan uh, in Guangdong. It's very interesting where the whole village essentially stood up and I think the solution is really very interesting because the solution, one of part of the solution was local people would be allowed to elect their officials. And uh, to me, that uh, could be very dramatic and have a lot of implication for how some of the leaders who are concerned that their leadership no longer has the support of people who regard them as legitimate, the fact that leaders took that support in that case, in Guangdong, in the Chaozhou area of Wukhan, uh, I think that could foretell certain kinds of changes under the new leadership. Well, perhaps this is also pertinent here. Another question from the media theater. Um, since they also have this room, I think we'll give him some chances of uh, raising those questions. This is about your take on the abuses of human rights, Chen uh, Guangcheng, and all that. Does the leadership, for example, Wen Jiabao, not want to stop this? Why aren't the Chinese leadership doing something to address these issues? They would call media theater. Um, I think that uh, part of the problem is that Chinese do not like to be lectured to by foreign countries about their abuse of human rights. The way they look at it is that uh, foreign critiques stir up their local people to make demands that they cannot fulfill. Uh, there's one thing that bothers me about the way these issues are handled, and that is that we have kind of famous case journalism and famous case concern. So uh, that suddenly an important case comes up in China and the Chinese don't find a way to resolve it. So they go to a foreign reporter, foreign reporter publicizes it, and then that person gets a lot of freedom. That's only one person. There are hundreds of thousands of Chinese who have similar problems. And I, 
I think the, the journalistic attention to that single case uh, begins to overpower the concern for the general system and the overall issues. And what, what I, I, I like, for example, uh, in this human rights area, the way that John Kim approaches the issues. This is a, a person who originally had been a businessman in Hong Kong uh, who now spends his time in a, a little group called Dui Hua, uh, which tries to carry on dialogue and information about more sources <clears throat> and tries to do it in a way that the Chinese can respond in a positive way. And he's really had hundreds and possibly even thousands of cases that he's taken up, often many quietly, often with only moderate publicity. And I, I think that you know, it, it, foreigners don't really help much by the overall lecturing to the Chinese. Uh, in that case, I might almost, uh, almost agree uh, with one of my Singapore friends uh, who talks about Asian values, uh, who is uh, <laughs> quite critical of the Westerners lecturing to, to China. Uh, talk about Asian values, I think this is the, the final question from the other room before we we'll turn back to uh, our audience here. Um, actually, there are two questions. One really concerns the staying power of the Chinese Empire as a uniting entity, and uh, to what extent that's compared with the that first. Okay, uh, is a comparison comparison with Russia in particular. Well, uh, let me say a word about China. Um, I'm worried now because I, I sense there's been a weakening of authority that uh, when the higher level, uh, say, uh, province tells the county what to do and the county tells uh, the local town or village what to do, that there are a lot of local people who don't listen anymore. And uh, I'm, I'm worried that the efforts of local people to control the, the, those people who uh, pay themselves hundreds and thousands of millions of dollars uh, and uh, award uh, opportunities to their friends. Uh, and I, I really feel that that sense of unified authority and respect for law, uh, which Singapore has been so successful in maintaining, I, I sense that, that somehow in the China, that, that overall authority is weak. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about that. And I think that the lead, part of the corruption issue is that they, the leaders need to set the proper example uh, and uh, that they, they aren't doing that. And uh, they need a bolder way to do that. I think it's interesting how the American ambassador in Beijing is announcing uh, how much his personal wealth is. Uh, the Chinese leaders are afraid to do that because so many of them have amassed so much money and even if one person hasn't, his friend has. And that would be, it would be some turmoil for them to try to do that. And when they can't do that, that weakens the respect for authority. And that's very troubling. Uh, I think what happened in the Soviet Union was different. What that, well, that may have been part of it, but you had half of the population was from various minority groups. And the people throughout various uh, republics within the Soviet Union uh, demanded freedom. Uh, and wanted to break away, it really split up the Soviet Union. I don't think that's the problem in China. I think the problem is the weakening of authority resulting from the lack of respect for and confidence in the legitimacy of their own leaders. Thank you. Second question that uh, La Wong Kim from Webcast 1401 raised is about uh, Martin Jake's uh, definition of nation state as compared I think that's actually also the other thing he used in his book, um, China's being, China being a civilization state, and how much the nation state contribute to the fragmentation of Europe. Uh, well, my uh, overview of this uh, is that uh, China, you know, only became a modern nation state uh, beginning in the 19th, 20th century. To be a nation state, one has to be under a system where others are comparable size and there's a comparable overall perspective. I think in China, we had a situation where China was the center, was the dominant civilization, and other 
places around the periphery uh, brought tribute or connected some kind of, developed some kind of relationship. You didn't have the state, the situation of relatively equal uh, countries of similar size bounded by a comprehensive set of outside rules. So I think it really is only in the 20th century uh, that China has become a nation state. And because it's the nation state with the largest population, because it has such a diversity of population and situation, I think it's very difficult to maintain the unity. Uh, you may recall that Deng Xiaoping once said, uh, when he was talking about Singapore, he said, if, only I, if I had only Shanghai to be responsible for, it would, my work would be much easier. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll return to uh, audience.